Welcome, everyone. Thanks for having us. We are Moret Surgical. My name is Avi Roop. I'm a biodesign fellow at Stanford University, joined by Dr. Tom Ruby, postdoctoral fellow in immunology, uh, Brian Dugan and Chris Pell, both uh, master's candidates in mechanical engineering, and Hattie Dong is a PhD candidate in electrical engineering at Stanford as well. Other team member that couldn't join us is Dr. Kevin Chow. He's a uh, neurosurgery resident at Stanford University. Moret Surgical, we are in the business of enabling surgery without visible scars. Uh, we need $600,000 uh, to be successful at this, to bring our technology to market, and at an early exit point, have it acquired by a major strategic partner. Now, we are offering an investment opportunity that would provide a 40 to 60% internal rate of return for our early investors. Now, to understand uh, how we're delivering NOSCAR uh, surgical tools, let's talk about our product, the Engage. Uh, we'll start by looking at a standard laparoscopic surgical tool. Standard tool has a handle set, five millimeter shaft, and then an end effector, which could be a grasper or scissor. What we do is we shrink that uh, shaft down to two millimeters and we split the tool into two parts. What this allows us to do is first puncture the abdominal wall with a shaft that is below the scarring threshold of 95% of the population. Imagine getting a blood draw out of your arm. There's no mark left behind. Subsequently, we, at we attach the uh, full-size tool head to that non-scarring shaft and we build a, a standard laparoscopic tool across the abdominal wall. Now, this is technology that's been invented by the team you see standing before you. Uh, we've been working on this over the past two years. It's covered by four provisional applications uh, with Stanford University, also a soon-to-be uh, filed PCT application. Now, as we're all students at Stanford University, the IP is owned by Stanford, currently working on an option to have an exclusive license for that technology. Uh, fortunately for ourselves and our investors, there's a precedent that Stanford commonly returns technology to the inventors because they provide the best home uh, for the product. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Tom Ruby to talk a little bit more about the need. 20 years ago, if you had to have your gallbladder removed, you would have undergone a massive surgery, which would have left you with a 10-inch incision scar on your abdomen, and you would have spent at least a week in the hospital. Now, over the past decade, laparoscopic surgery has become the dominant way abdominal surgery is performed. This is done through the insertion of a video camera through your belly button and you, the use of a series of extended tools crossing your abdominal walls. Still, this leaves you with a series of four or five different scars, one or two inch long. What we want to do is to go from here to here. And you won't be surprised to hear that patients would prefer this solution. Why do we want to eliminate incision? We are not just getting rid of ugly scars, but numerous clinical studies show that reducing the number and the size of the incision reduces the pain from the patient reduces the need for painkillers. Patient enjoys short hospital stay, faster recovery, and it also decreases the risk of secondary contamination such as pneumonia. The laparoscopic tool markets look like this. Uh, three segments, 6% annual growth. We will be competing mainly in the access and the resection segment. Today it's worth almost $3 billion. Three main players here. Ethicon, the subdivision of uh, Johnson & Johnson, Carl Storrs, and Covidian. Not surprisingly, these three dominant players are trying to achieve a no-scar surgery solution because in 2015, this no-scar segment will be worth half a billion dollars. They are trying to do this mainly in two ways. The first one is to use a single port laparoscopic surgery. This forces a surgeon to do the entire procedure through your belly button. The surgeon has to cross his instrument. This feels uneasy the operative space is crowded, and the price of this tool is still very expensive compared to the recurrent reimbursement rate. Another solution is to reduce the overall size of the tool, but then surgeon will tell you the tool head has now become too small for them to perform a safe and effective surgery. That's why we think there is a better solution that could meet all these needs, and I will let Brian walk you through the solution we came up with. So our solution is the best option for patients because it doesn't result in a scar. But it's also the best result for surgeons because it doesn't require a change in their behavior. This is how a standard laparoscopic surgery looks. There's a large incision in the belly button for the camera, and then there are several secondary incisions around the abdomen to allow the doctor to triangulate his position inside the abdomen. This gives him room to work and makes it easier for him to access the different parts of the procedure. Our competitors, the single laparoscopic port surgery forces the surgeons to use all of their tools through the belly button, which makes them all in line. It's much harder to do the procedure, and it takes a lot longer. Our system enables them to do the surgery as they've always done it, with the secondary sites 
only now without adding scars to the patient. Let me walk you through how this works. At the beginning of the surgery, the abdomen's inflated as normal. When the camera's inserted, we introduce full-size laparoscopic tooltips that the surgeons are used to working with, along with the camera, taking advantage of the hidden scar inside the belly button. We then use thin, non-scarring needle shafts through the abdominal wall and connect those to the full-size tooltips that are now inside the abdomen. These are assembled with visualization from the camera, so it's very easy to do, it's quick, and it's just a simple twist lock motion. It's also very safe. The system supports multiple tools so the surgeon can do the procedure as they've always done it with multiple tools, multiple tool heads. And when they're finished with a specific tool head, they can simply relock it back into the introduction mechanism and take it out through the umbilical cord. Basically, allowing them to do the surgery as they've always done it, only now without adding any scars. And Chris is gonna to talk to you about our technology. So as you can imagine, a concern that arises with any modular tool that's assembled inside the body is what happens if you accidentally drop or leave a piece inside. Well, the mechanism that we've designed makes that virtually impossible while still providing a very fast and simple solution to surgeons. We've designed it to utilize common, well-established manufacturing processes such as CNC machining and laser tube cutting. We've also designed in several assembly features to keep assembly costs low moving forward. We're currently in a prototyping phase, transitioning from our large-scale plastic prototypes to two-scale metal components. And based on conversations with our local manufacturers, along with our low production runs, we estimate the unit cost of these two-scale prototypes would be about $1,000. Moving towards a product launch, we'll be using uh, production-level tooling and slightly larger production runs to reduce that cost to around $400 per unit. And then through further improvement on both, of both the manufacturing and design side, along with moving manufacturing overseas, we think we can reduce that unit cost down to $200. So with a product like this, intellectual property and freedom to operate are very important. And Hattie's going to take you through that process. Thank you, Chris. The novelty of the engaged mechanism is the ability to assemble a laparoscopic tool across an abdominal wall in order to eliminate scars while preserving the triangulation that the surgeons are used to. As Abby mentioned, we have filed four provisional patents with the Stanford OTL and USPTO. And we are also in the process of filing an international PCT in a few weeks. Here are the three key pieces of IP that will go into our PCT. The twist lock connection mechanism that Chris and Brian just talked about that we've invented, modular tool assembly concept, as well as a specific introducer with holding ring that we've also invented. Now, the laparoscopic devices market is crowded. Therefore, it is important for us to have freedom to operate in order to move forward as a leading product. We have reviewed over 200 pieces of IP to date, and we have identified a dozen relevant patents. We're working with a prominent San Francisco law firm to perform detailed legal analysis on each of those patents. The initial opinion that we received from a lawyer is that FTO does exist for Engage. Now, what about the FTA? Two regulatory pathways exist to receive marketing approval from the FDA. One, pre-market notification, also known as the 510K, is for lower risk devices. Two, pre-market approval, also known as the PMA, is for higher risk devices that require extensive clinical trials. Now, Engage meets all the requirements to pursue the much simpler 510K pathway. Here are two products that have features or concepts similar to Engage, and both of them have received 510K clearance in under six months. Based on our studies of the regulatory pathway and these examples, we plan to achieve 510K clearance by the first quarter of 2011. Now, Avi will walk us through how we plan to proceed as a company. Thanks, Hattie. As Tom talked about, uh, the competitive uh, companies are forcing surgeons to learn a completely new way to perform standard operations, such as gallbladder removal and appendix removal. They've trained roughly three to 500 surgeons to date. There's been about 3,000 cases done of single port surgery in the United States. The difficulty is, is these are very complex articulating tools that cost roughly two to three times what a current uh, expenditure is costed for a standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Alternatively, we are providing simply better laparoscopic surgical tools, which 
allows us to uh, have access to the in entire installed base of 13,000 general laparoscopic surgeons. And really all we're asking surgeons to learn how to do new is attach a non-scarring shaft to an end effector, and that's something we can do in the break room. In addition, because of the COGS estimates that Chris talked about, we're able to offer a product that's much more in line with uh, current reimbursement. Now, our operational plan has changed relative to what's in our written business plan. We're currently looking for $600,000 to support the $120,000 of grant funding we currently have to get this product 510K cleared and develop early human experience with it. We think those are the minimum milestones that would attract uh, interest from a strategic uh, partner. Now, understanding that that exit may not occur, we've also modeled out what it would take to get our business to a cash flow break-even position. Our strategy down that path would be to still pursue strategic co-investment and co-distribution, and we think it would take roughly $7.5 million at a minimum investment to get to about $9 million a year in annual revenue and bring the business to uh, generating cash. In terms of strategic investment, there's two paths. There are the companies that have a strong presence in no-scar surgery and those that don't. Interestingly enough, the, those that don't are also the ones that make laparoscopic cameras. Now, as the camera, as you remember, the camera is a fundamental piece of our introduction tool, and Moret's technology would provide a fantastic complement to their platform technology. On the other hand, if Moret is sold to a company with a significant presence in no-scar surgery, we would position ourselves as a portfolio uh, risk management opportunity or as we're simply building better laparoscopic surgical tools, we could provide some uh, sales price risk mitigation. When I used to work at St. Jude Medical, I was involved in a couple deals that were uh, pre-commercial that garnered uh, exits and offers between five and eight million dollars. One of those was aimed at the, uh, that time, the $500 million carotid stenting space. The other was aimed at the $200 million lap, uh, uh, excuse me, cardiac minimally invasive surgical tool space. Based on that comparable analysis, we think at an early point with an approved product and early human clinical data, we would warrant a valuation in the six to $8 million range. Giving up 20% of our company uh, for that early $600,000 investment would return uh, 40 to 60%, uh, uh, provide an IRR for our investors of 40 to 60%. Now, in addition to the talent you see up here, we've also amassed a team to help us do two things very well. One, build a great laparoscopic surgical tool. Two, get in front of the business development functions that these potential acquirers on the tool front, we've got Dr. Tom Crummel and Dr. Jim Lau. Dr. Crummel is the chair of surgery at Stanford University. Jim Lau is the uh, preeminent single port surgeon at Stanford, also on the board of Ethicon Endo, training surgeons in single port laparoscopic surgery today. On the business side, we've got two venture capitalists, Rich Ferrari and Josh Boltzell. They work at DeNovo and Split Rock Partners. In addition, we have an ex-VP from the Johnson & Johnson Development Corporation, Roger Guidi, to help us further our relationship with uh, Ethicon Endo Surgery. Now, going forward, we're working to create, uh, uh, acquire some animal data from our next generation prototype. We're also working on uh, design verification and validation testing to support uh, writing a 510K submission. In a few weeks, we're going to uh, uh, an advanced uh, gastroendological surgery uh, meeting called SAGES in Maryland. That's where we'll start record recruiting a scientific advisory board. Aim with the scientific advisory board is to get access to the, the other companies that make laparoscopic cameras, so Carl Storrs, Olympus. And Finally, we're working to further our relationship with Ethicon uh, through Jim Lau and Roger Guidi. In addition, we have a relationship through Stanford Biodesign with Scott Wolf, partner at, at, used to be a partner at Prospect, now running the uh, development arm, uh, corporate development arm at uh, Covidian Surgical. So thank you for your time. Open ourselves up to questions at this point. We will now begin our 20-minute Q&A session. Each judge will be asking one question at a time, and we, the questions will begin with Mr. Jim Morris. Okay, uh, actually, I mean, you, you kind of uh, touched on it a little bit pretty quickly, but um, your background, you've uh, been involved in five other medical devices uh, launching those products. Can you discuss the lessons you've learned uh, from those launches and how that might be helpful in Moret? Yeah, uh, I think, I'll, yes. So the, you, you the, touched on it, yeah. The primary, the primary uh, thing I've learned in my career at St. Jude Medical and, and a few other companies mm -hmm. is that speed is life. So. Um, I've been involved in, in technologies where we waited too long to let it out of the R&D lab, and ultimately we missed the, the window of opportunity. That's where our strategy is about getting uh, a 510K submit, submission written as rapidly as possible on a minimum viable product. As some of you know, the FDA is changing. The understanding around what is a 510K clearable product is changing, and we want to move as rapidly as possible. So I'd say the primary lesson is to move as quickly as possible and be willing to make uh, some sacrifices to release a, a viable product, but not the perfect product. Thank you. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, I have a few related questions. Number one, you right now you're at a 10-time model right now? We have a 5X model here. Uh, all right, a 5X model. And how long did you say it's going to take to get to the actual size what? that's uh, necessary? We're currently in the process of quoting out parts. Um, and we need to basically find the best cost option for us based on if we want to go local or somebody a little bit further away. But we think we can get parts back in a month and be ready to start testing. Okay. And, and also, how about some other non-traditional competitors? Could you talk a little bit about uh, procedures going through the mouth and natural mm. openings in the body? Sure. As well as on the plastic surgery side, there's a lot of tissue um, science out there right now that can pretty much very close to covering up scars or at the incision point. Yeah. Have you thought about that and what's your response, please? So I'll, I'll speak first to notes. Nat notes is natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, transoral, transrectal, transvaginal. Um, the, there have been very few true notes procedures performed, less than 500. Most of them are laparoscopically assisted. Uh, the downside of notes is that A, it's, it's an extensive retraining effort for general surgeons. You have to teach them how to use a, uh, an endoscope in a new way. And in addition, uh, the tools are, are incredibly expensive. They're well beyond what's currently reimbursed. Current lap coli, for example, is about three dollars to $5,000 of reimbursement. Uh, these tools would, would basically make that an unprofitable procedure for the hospital. Other uh, novel wound healing products, for example, uh, there, there's a lot of that work going on at Stanford, actually in the same building we're in. Um, you know, it gets to the question of, is this purely cosmetic or are there other benefits? Mm -hmm. And there really are other benefits for the young and the old in terms of minimizing the overall incision length because there's a significant risk to incision in a hospital. And, and as uh, many of you may know, uh, you know, certain types of hospital acquired infections are no longer covered by Medicare. So there's a lot of impetus to, to minimize the overall risk once an operation is done and get that patient you know, out of the hospital as quickly as possible because it's, it's expensive to, to keep them in those beds. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, window of opportunity and the need for speed in terms mm -hmm. of getting this going. Are there other people working on similar devices? There, there are no other people working on assemblable devices across the abdominal wall. As we talked about, there are many companies working to develop advanced tools that all work through the belly button. And uh, you mentioned the risk, obviously, speed and getting mm -hmm. things done. Are there any other risks to the business? Well, the, 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 the primary risk to the business is whether or not we can generate enough revenue. If we're not acquired RAP at this early exit point, will we be able to generate revenue fast enough? Our th or early, the, the, the business model that you see, in the, actually in the written, written business plan, is to raise enough money to hire a very lean small sales force and drive revenue to a minimum threshold that would represent, would warrant acquisition based on some comparable analysis. Ethicon and J&J have both made recent acquisitions of surgical tool companies once they hit this 10 to $20 million revenue sweet spot. Uh, we felt there was a lot of risk to building our own sales force and competing with companies that had 240 reps in the field, long-standing relationships. So, uh, you know, Hitting, hitting revenue targets would, is a high risk. That's why our strategy includes um, strategic co-development and co-distribution with somebody who's already got the distribution channel. And in that sort of worst case scenario, who, who are you selling to or who are you targeting first, second, and third? In terms of the strategic partners? No, in terms of who you would sell the product oh, the, the, to if you don't get the strategic partnerships. The, the, uh, I mean, the customer is the general surgeon. The based on there's so reimbursement has two buckets, facility reimbursement and physician reimbursement. Tools are covered by the facility reimbursement, so we have to ensure that the hospital the hospital has to buy the technology. Commonly, uh, these technologies in big academic centers have to go through a value assessment team. Uh, in smaller ambulatory surgery centers, it's more of a relationship with the manager of that of that setting. The, uh, the, the what we're selling to the facility is that you're going to be able to advertise and provide a no scar, you know, advanced general surgery to your patients which is good for their business. In addition, we provide the lowest cost alternative to do so that requires the, the least amount of retraining. So even if you have a strategic partnership, have you factored in the timing of those uh, value trials or whatever you the call sale, them? The sales cycle, yeah, yeah. We think that the sales cycle for uh, this new tool would be two to four months uh, from first engaging the hospital to actually getting an order put on the shelf. Uh, that, that's based on uh, uh, direct uh, interviews at Stanford University. Could you um, <clears throat> characterize the intellectual property for me? Do you have a patent on assembling in the body? Is it that high a level, or is it for laparoscopic instruments? Mm -hmm. 
It's, so, it's, it's slightly more structurally specific. There are two method-based patents that are at a very high level okay. talking about assembling tools across the abdominal wall. One is invalid because they didn't, uh, one is expired because they didn't pay the maintenance fees. The other is active. It's got about two years left of life on it. What we believe is novel is the method by which we uh, assemble and lock the uh, non-scarring shaft to the end effector such that you can't leave it behind, if you will. So that, that uh, sequential locking mechanism is novel. In addition, the introduction tool, uh, the, the method of introducing an end effector with a laparoscopic camera, and then the specific apparatus to, to assemble the tools. But if I could figure out another way to lock, to lock it, mm -hmm. I would not be infringing on your patent. I can assemble inside across the abdominal wall. Well, we, we are, our PCT application includes method, so, some method claims and apparatus claims. We have written method claims around the, the abstract concept of locking a uh, tool together to, to promote speed and safety. So we've worked to cover that in as broad a fashion as possible. Uh, in addition, our, our FTO work that is, we're paying for out of this grant money is, is furthermore helping us understand the, the, the available patent landscape that we can try to fill with our claim language. The, the other question I had, the, I love that the phrase was used virtually impossible. Could you, you just tell me a little bit about if it virtually, that means it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah. What so, do you do? So, to, to leave a tool behind. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> so uh, it's not virtually impossible because we haven't had a chance to do extensive testing. Um, theoretically, it should be impossible, but as an no, engineer, it's hard it for me to say. What's yeah. that? What if it happens? What if it happens? Yeah. So if it happens and it did fall off, it's, it's actually fairly common for surgeons to drop things inside the body such as sutures. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds really bad, but it is fairly common. And so when they're using sutures and stuff, they'll drop them, and that's a needle. And they can find that actually pretty well. And they have an inventory system in the hospital, which we can actually leverage with our introduction device. Because we can, we can have, a, a, it's like an empty spot. So they pull out the camera and they still have this empty spot, so they know that they have to go back and find this thing. Um, so, yeah. Basically at the beginning and end of every procedure, they count the number of tools it'd be very obvious if one of the tools was missing. So the risk to actually leaving a device behind is extremely low. And worst case scenario, you just go back to the, the usual method, you insert a port, you go with standard tools, and retract what you left behind. He's yeah. talking about if the, the, mech, the locking mechanism were to fail and you couldn't release it, your worst case scenario, because the outer diameter of the tool head is the standard laparoscopic tool size, you'd simply, worst case, have a scar um, comparable to how you would with standard laptops. Yeah. 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 You talk about the unit being sold for eleven $1 hundred dollars, is that mm. correct? And, yes. and do you what do you estimate you're costing us on that? Chris talked about the COGS. Currently we're spending about a thousand dollars to make these prototypes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plans to bring that cost of goods down to two hundred dollars. Right. And this is for a kit. How does your price compare with price standard? Oh. Uh, I yield to the gentleman on the end. Oh, no. I can, I can answer that quickly. Uh, okay. Let me ask you. Uh, real quick, on, con on contract pricing for basically a full kit for a lap coley is about six to $700. Off contract pricing is about eight to $900. We are charging a premium beyond that because obviously we have the no score result. The SILS toolkit that Covidian offers is about $1,800. Reimbursement for lap coley on average three to $4,000. Just a follow-up to, to Brian's question. I, I look at your, your, your costing for your manufacturing cost from 2012 to 2015, and you basically go from $193 per unit down to $15 per unit. Um, how realistic are these numbers, and how much research have you done as far as your manufacturing? Because it seems like that's a pretty uh, drastic uh, economy of scale. Um, so as far as for the scale prototypes, we have quotes back from that. And so that's based purely on those quotes. Um, as far as reducing the cost, that's based on trends that we've seen in other products. I mean, we're, we're looking to exploit you know, cheaper labor rates. The other thing to remember is this is a kit of tools. So we're selling you know, multiple handle sets and multiple end effectors. And really the only thing we're, that we're in, inventing is, is the, uh, the introduction mechanism and the attachment. The graspers, that's all very well understood manufacturing technology. A lot of vendors do that. Handle sets, again, standard tools. So the, the level of novelty is, is very small. In addition, these guys have done a great job turning this design into something that can be done with laser cutting and CNC machining. So nothing, nothing exotic. All right, and just to switch gears real quick, your uh, time to market's really important. You had stated that 
I look at your sales force and the money that you have in budgeted for a sales team and a direct sales team at yeah. that. Is that realistic in your mind? Uh, so part of the reason, I mean, obviously we went through the feedback uh, wildcard round. Part of the feedback was, was a little bit uh, fairly aggressive. So we uh, changed our strategy to look at an early exit. Understanding that, uh, understanding that $2 million uh, revenue target per rep is on the very high side of, of reality, uh, which is why we think that you know, building a small sales force of Moret staff and doing co-distribution with, a, again, a, a portion of, uh, for example, Covidian Salesforce would allow us to get to that $9 million revenue target. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Eddie, you have, you have a lot of experience in the Silicon Valley marketing uh, medical products, right? Didn't you? Yeah, didn't you? Is that? Had yeah, had yeah had exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's your background, some, right? Yeah. Some through courses at Stanford University. Pardon? Some through classes at Stanford University. Oh, okay, that, I thought I didn't hear that it said that you'd worked for a number of firms in the Valley marketing medical product. Uh, through consulting right. projects okay, from cool. classes at Stanford Okay, can you talk to me then about uh, the products that you've marketed, uh, your experience with uh, some of your more successful products, and then um, what your marketing strategy would be for Marette? So uh, the most recent product I've worked on is not actually in the medical device uh, field. We uh, worked with a, um, a uh, uh, telecommunications company that tries to reach the youth market in France and uh, in Silicon Valley. What they do is they have a mod mobile, mobile technology that allows you to interact with a screen or, or um, at a stadium. So, their technology, um, they have some success in France. They try to bring that to the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, we as a team, in, uh, in through a Stanford class, help them to try to target the youth market. OK, that's good. Great. Yeah. Then I have one other quick question. In the, in the business plan, it says that you're selling half the company for 600000 and then you, you change the deal on us, it, it looks like. Yeah. So um, what's, what's the deal? Is yeah, it, so we'll, and, and then why did you change it? Yeah. And then also, if this is such a great market opportunity, why would you have considered selling half the company for $600,000? So the, the half the company uh, originally, so again, change based yeah. on feedback we got over the past few days. Half the company comes from uh, norms we've seen in the Silicon Valley area where the Design program is very well connected with the venture capital community. We've heard uh, and heard of a lot of deals being closed at, at 50 to 60 percent ownership, um, so th it's it, it, we'd, we've heard of early stage deals having to require you know giving up 50 to 60 percent control of the company to get that financing. So that's originally where we got the 55 percent number. You know, based on some feedback uh, of if we raised less money and had an earlier exit strategy, we could go after more high net worth individuals that would be willing to uh, you know n not be looking for controlling rights of the company. So it's basically a, a non-VC strategy that was was before a VC strategy. Then my final question, what's the likelihood, because you have a number of examples for companies like Google and Sun that actually came off the campus and the university was the first customer, what's the likelihood that, that Stanford University, the hospital, would actually be one of your first customers? I think, it, I think it's very likely. I mean, yeah. the chair of surgery is one of our advisors. I've uh, been, been with this technology since the beginning, extremely passionate about it. He's one of the ones that's motivating us to continue to work on it. Uh, so, so uh, you know, he and then Jim Lau, who is the guy who's doing most, most of the single port surgery at Stanford University, both it, familiar with technology, helping us develop it, and would be more than willing to use it. So Great. strategy there would be, let's talked about before, IRB, we'd get some IRB, get IRB approval after our first 510K, get early use, and then convert that to sales. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I'm interested, why did you, ch other than just listening to other people, why did you change your strategy of one of quick exit instead of building something and yeah. do a much higher value? Well, you know, we're, we're good at product development. I mean, I have an engineering background also, did marketing for a few years at St. Jude Medical. We're, we're really good at early product development. And, you know, if, if it was my money, um, I'd be looking, if we're gonna, if for my money to build a commercial entity, I'd be looking for someone with a tremendous amount of commercial management experience to, to take that over. So I think we're all real realistic that we have, a, we have a lot of value to add in this early stage sweet spot, and if it needs to go further, we can be part of the team, but you know, we definitely encourage you know, more seasoned professional to take the reins. Great. Okay. Very good, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.